Hello and welcome to the EDFL Web TV podcast. Teo Pelizzeri here at Windy Hill. It's a mild winter evening here and we've got a full pod. Dave Kennedy is here. Dave, welcome back. Teo, great to be here. Windy Hill, uh, it's a, a very nice environment always. So podcasting, filming, whatever it is, always good to be here. Well, and speaking of filming, if you haven't watched the on-camera segment this week, of course, we've uh, reviewed round nine and previewed round ten, talked about all the big issues. Uh, just click st- back through to the EDFL YouTube channel. Adam Sarakoglu, hello. How are we? Um, yeah, no, Windy Hill's a nice little place to be at, guys, and uh, actually comes up well under lights. I'm not usually here at night, and... Uh, I like the ambiance of it all. And returning to the pod, Adam Russell, uh, back for another go. So you must have done all right last week. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. Good to be back. Uh, just chilling in the Alan Hurd stand, I believe we are. But no, this is the Cookson stand. This is the Cookson stand. You only had two to choose from. Oh, <laughs> Worth a crack. And uh, Claire Varley is in the pod as well. Claire, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, especially with all the wonderful umpires training on the ground. Well, uh, they've uh, got really good numbers out here tonight. Of course, uh, the umpire is always a hot topic in the EDFL, but we're going to talk about matters regarding football. And let's start with Strathmore Community Bank Division 2, because that's where the broadcast has been the last couple of weeks. If you're not familiar with the podcast format, if you go down and click Show More, you can see the interviews from the post-game show. We also spoke to Dean. Wallace as part of the pregame show. Adam Russell caught up with Adam Potter, the Aberfeldy coach. So plenty of interviews from the weekend radio as well. And the time code links, if you click them, will take you straight there. But what we're going to do is talk about the results in the meantime. And well, the broadcast game was a little bit anticlimactic. I suppose we went along knowing that Roxburgh Park had held Coburg Districts to just two goals last time they played. So uh, 12 at 22, 94 to 7, 9, 51. That's been revised since the weekend because it came in as uh, 12, 24, 96, but it's only a couple of behinds either way. And Dave, I think inaccurate kicking and the fact that Roxburgh Park perhaps could have won by more was a, a theme that uh, everyone took out of this match at the weekend. Yeah, I, I think so. Particularly the number one person that, that mentioned it was the coach of Coburg Districts, uh, Chris Tankard. So I think that um, when uh, when you have so many inside 50s, when you have so many um, raw opportunities to score, you, you should probably capitalise more than Roxburgh Park did, but uh, it was a good win in the end. They got the job done and uh, I'm sure that they'll move on to next week with a, a bit of confidence. And uh, Adam Sarakoglu, uh, what impressed you about Roxburgh Park? I mean, we haven't seen them, seen them play Hatfield. Adam Russell has, and we'll go to Adam in a, a moment. But uh, this really was sort of flexing their muscle and heading into a game against Mooney Valley this weekend. They continue to reinforce that uh, as last year's grand finalists, they probably deserve to remain the second best team in the league. Well, I think they have a side... In- the makeup of their side that is better suited to Division 2 than what Coburg Districts is. They seem a little bit too top-heavy to Districts, whereas uh, Roxy, in uh, this sort of division, when you've got that speed and a lot of good, highly skilled players, uh, they're going to be pretty hard to beat. And um, I think we saw that firsthand on the weekend. I was really impressed by how they were running on top of the ground, running in waves, a couple of really nice passages put together, and DK's man uh, lighting it up as well. Actually, he stole the call off me every time Marguerite went near the ball, but... uh, yeah, that, that's what really impressed me about Rockford Park, just the way they ran. I mean, really impressive. A uh, lot of good young players in this side, and uh, they've improved on last year, that's for sure. Adam Russell, uh, you were not at the game, but uh, you have seen Rockford Park play Hatfield this season. Does it uh, reinforce to you that Rockford Park is the next best contender, and they want to close the gap? Do you think they actually can, though? Can they close the gap to unbeaten Hatfield at the moment? Yeah, well, I have I have rated Roxy quite highly in the last few weeks. I have... Uh, Back them as my the team that could take it to Hadfield and then you know, Hadfield they've been so impressive but I think I do like the work of Roxy and I think you guys can agree with me now winning a, a game against Coburg Districts where can be considered one of the uh, other contenders for that finals football and uh, they come up against Chicana this weekend so another another chance for Roxy to prove themselves. Claire Valley, uh, you were on the sidelines for this game. It was a very calm Roxburgh Park bench. I understand not too much shouting, not too much uh, activity down there. I mean, it, it's in stark contrast to the way some benches operate in the EDFL. But what were your impressions of just how Roxy played and also Paul Derrick and, and how he runs things on match day? I think what I really took away from it was how um, realistic everyone do- was down there. They kind of didn't see it as a life or death situation, which some of the higher divisions have seemed to really, really take it to heart, whereas they were really practical about it. And they really, they were there to play football and play sport and they were happy with the way things went. What about the surprise of the warm down? I mean, we, we sent you over to grab our uh, sports moves best on ground, Jaden Walker and also Paul Derrick after the match, but 
Uh, the, the trainer whisked the team away to do a warm down, which is something that we have not seen, I don't think, at any other EDFL club around the division. So, I mean, what did you make of that when it all started unfolding? I was incredibly impressed when they whipped out the stretching bands because there is nothing more important in exercise than stretching and warming down. And perhaps we should look into the statistics of injury occurrence in Division 2 versus Strathmore Community Bank Premier Division. Well, can I, can I just say, on behalf of the radio, um, I'd love them to leave it until after they fulfil media commitments, but uh, I mean, it, it was pretty interesting to see that level of professionalism that they were going about it with. I think it was really mature, and I think it was really smart and sensible, especially when they're young men and they don't want to have knee reconstructions before they're 20, you know? Yeah, potentially lessons learned after last year. Um, a side that probably does want to go up and getting relatively close last year. So perhaps that's where that sort of mentality is coming from. Uh, I think they're a team that's almost ready to go up into Division 1. And putting that in, in contrast to Coburg Districts, Chris Tankard says he likes to hold his initial post-match talk out on the ground because in his words, and you can see it on the EDFL uh, Web TV podcast if you click through to his interview at the end, players sneak away during the, uh, the, the post-match warm down in the rooms. So uh, I found that interesting. Well, I think that goes back to what Claire was saying. That's a really interesting point that in Division 2, you know, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit more relaxed, but you know, you, in that sense, you still need to be vigilant with the players, and and it is more social, so they need to make sure that uh, the players uh, that you're not holding them up for too long. And I, re- I reckon that's great. I reckon that's refreshing for Chris Tankard to say that's the reason. You know, he didn't uh, he didn't shirk the issue. He said, "Well, look, we've got players that want to." go early so uh, you know we did the the only thing practical and we make sure that we talk to them after the or straight after the match and uh, Claire you spoke to Chris Tankard as as you were bringing him back to the the radio van as the defeated coach I understand that uh, their their rooms weren't too downhearted but what were the impressions that you got from Coburg District's performance and and obviously you spent a fair portion of the match behind their bench as well over the course of the day I think the thing I took away from it was how mature they were about it all because I asked Chris Tankard how he was feeling and then sort of apologised that he might be feeling a bit upset. He said, no, I'm okay. It's just football and, you know, we're all okay and we'll, we've had a good season and they were the better side and that's just the way it goes. Um, as far as, you know, the standard of footy, you've now seen Premier, you've seen Div 1, you've seen Div 2. Uh, and I'll ask Adam and Dave this as well. I mean, how, how did you see the game as a spectacle at the weekend? Because I thought it... it, it sort of dragged a little at times but on the whole I mean it was a good enough showing from two teams that would have started the season hoping to win promotion at the end of it. Look I honestly came away from it thinking it was one of the more entertaining games that I've had this season. I I enjoyed it and I came away from it feeling like we'd watched a solid performance from two improving teams. And Dave we've seen Glenroy and Hillside who are in the bottom end of Division 1, East Keeler of course down there as well but uh, based on what we've seen from these two teams, do you think there was a great deal of difference? Because I would have to say, if you put Roxburgh Park up against Glenroy or Roxburgh Park up against Hillside next week, it'd be a, a pretty close contest. Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure who I would pick. Oh, I think that there is a difference, but I don't think that that difference is based purely on... Um it's not based on things that can't be improved on. I think that um, fitness was was an issue when you've got players that uh, just can't quite keep up, and and that's that's something that if uh, if Roxburgh Park or Coburg Districts was to move up, well, that's something that they'd they'd address. So, yeah, look at at this stage, they're probably not at it. But the thing that I found most impressive about it was that they both had game styles, they both had game plans, and they both attempted to execute it. We saw Coburg Districts go towards uh, their bench side of the ground, uh, and they, they continually did that. So that, to me, suggests structure, and it suggests continuity of structure. So at least they're trying to do the right things uh, to move up a division. I think you might have been just a tad harsh on both these clubs, Teo. The, the, the gap between Div 1 and Div 2, I don't think, is anywhere near as great as between Premier and Div 1. Um, Coburg Districts will have to, if they were to go up somehow, um, obviously have to improve in a lot of areas. Uh, you know, fitness obviously being one of them, perhaps get some uh, classier players through the midfield as well. Perhaps even though even though uh, Tommy Lucent is an absolute gun, I liked what he brought to the table on Saturday. But uh, I think Roxy would run a lot of a lot of sides in Div One uh, pretty close right now. Let's go through the rest of the games in Strathmore Community Bank Division 2, and I think we need to start with this one. Jakarta 36-16, 232, 
beating Burnside Heights 4-4-28. Chris Johnson reliably informs me that he actually kicked 11 at the weekend uh, and that he's on the web with eight because Bryce Kemalitis has been credited with two of his goals and Eddie Edis with one. So uh, take that for what it's worth. It was uh, unfortunately a, a bit of a slaughter. And I did some homework on this. Burnside Heights, the team that beat Keylor Park about a month ago compared to the team that played Jakarta at the weekend had seven changes and three of those players actually played under 18s at the weekend rather than in the seniors. We heard a, a few rumours at the weekend that maybe uh, politics of selection had, had come into play and guys that are still eligible for 16s or eligible for 18s are being made to play in their age group. But, I mean, it was only three players. I, I actually went and did the homework just to work out whether it was a bit of an ambit claim or whether there was any justification. But, I mean, they have turned over a third of their side since that Keelor Park game that they did win. So it... it the milk really has gone sour, to quote Rory Breaker here. I mean, it, 200 points is, is a new low for, for Burnside Heights, and unfortunately that's you know, four triple-figure defeats in their last five games. Uh, uh, can we quickly touch on the under-18s aspect? What, why, why is that, Taylor? Why would an under-18s coach, um, I guess, take players from a senior side? And, and I'm not saying it's happened in this context, um, but... What, what benefit is there for a team in terms of the structure of the league? Well, sometimes it could be the difference between fielding a team and, and having to push under 14s up to play 16s or having to push 16s up to play 18s. So it could be the difference between fielding a proper team and not. It could be the difference between making finals and not. There's also a school of thought that you come through with your age group and, and that you want to graduate together as a, a playing class. And, and the example is there a couple of years ago, James Siragius and Braden Padmore were playing under 16s for Mooney Valley all year. They get knocked out of the... Uh, under 16s finals they both play the senior prelim final and the two of them I think kicked something like 8 out of 12 goals having not played senior footy all year so the the politics of selection and and maybe it's something that premier clubs never even have to think about but down in division 2 you might only have one team per age group as well it is something that does pop up from time to time and I'm sympathetic to the clubs because the last thing you want is an internal tug of war between a couple of coaches who, at the end of the day, they both want to win for their club and they both have the club's best interests at heart. Politics at Burnside Heights, eh? It is an allegation. I mean, like I said, it was only three guys from that Keelor Park win just... who played under-18s at the weekend. There were four other guys who played in that win that weren't part of the seniors at the weekend. I guess that's just part of the induction of uh, coming into the EDFL. Uh, you know, we talk about Burnside Heights as just a... A fledging uh, senior club, uh, pretty well established now as juniors, but uh, now that there might be some in-house stuff going on. They've just uh, sort of cemented themselves as an EDFL club, I guess. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not a positive, but it's good to say. We shouldn't get bogged down in, in talking about the team that was beaten, though. Jakarta, I mean, Adam Russell, we were criticising their, their scoring power after the East Sunbury game, that they sort of won a bit of a, a struggle there and, and got them at arm's length without ever really breaking the shackles. But... Obviously, uh, they were able to open up and kick 36 goals at the weekend, and it was it was balanced as well. It was 18 at half time, 36 at full time, so they really had a day out. Yeah, we did keep mentioning during that uh, East Sunbury call that it was it was a game you kind of should have looked at to build their percentage, but they've uh, they've bounced back strongly. Even though they did get the four points against East Sunbury um, to come out last week and win by 200 points, was it? Yeah, yeah, 204. You know, that's the percentage they needed, and. I think it's uh, they'll be happy with that, but you know they've still got a lot of work before they can be too happy. Strathmore Community Bank Division Two. We move on to Hadfield, twenty-eight one twenty-eight beating Keelor Park twelve six seventy-eight. Hadfield roll on. Uh, Adam, we'll, we'll only briefly touch on this. Uh, the unbeaten season continues, and really we're we're waiting for a challenger to emerge to uh, take on the Hawks here and. Keelor Park were pretty much at, a, at safe distance after quarter time and unable to close that gap. Matty Patane or Patani? Because I think we disagree on that one, Adam Russell. I'd go Patani. Patane it is. I, um, think, I think it's Patane, yeah. <laughs> he's kicked six. You've, um, just, you've just tipped in Adam <laughs> Russell there. Something shocking, by the way. Yeah, well, he's making his debut alongside me this weekend, by the way, so I look forward to that. Anyway, um, yeah, not not sure what uh, Hadfield exactly... Whether whether they were 100 percent or not, but uh, at least Kilwa Park were competitive. They weren't exactly blown out of the water completely, uh, to be honest. 78 to 128, I think it was. Taylor. 
Uh, probably a good result for Keeler Park, to be honest. And East Sunbury, uh, 147 to 61 defeat against Mooney Valley. Mooney Valley, no surprises there, um, able to record a convincing win. They might have liked a bit more percentage given the situation. Sam O'Brien kicked eight, Braden Padmore kicked four, Curtis Tankard best on ground. But the, the improved application and competitiveness from East Sunbury, perhaps reflective here that uh, in previous seasons, this could have got out of hand and, and pushed up to 100 plus, 150 plus. But I don't know, maybe East Sunbury kicking 8 13, 21 scoring shots. Yeah, that might be reflective of some of that positive momentum that uh, is starting to build down there, even though it's not always translating to wins. Yeah, without seeing the game, obviously, but it is vaguely positive for uh, East Sunbury. Ogilvy named in the best again. I think his good form continuing on. I think they'll be happy with that and they can uh, probably build a little bit going forward into this season. And Claire Valley, as we uh, wish you farewell from the podcast, we're, we're not uh, with you for Greenvale versus Aberfeldy this weekend. No, unfortunately not. So uh, just uh, to preempt our, our tips for the weekend, what is your pick? Will Aberfeldy stay unbeaten in Premier Division or will Greenvale break through and be the first team to beat them this year? I believe so. So as the resident EDFL tipping champion, you are you, you are now the outright leader, that is correct. Now, always. For this week, Claire. Uh, we'll see about that, Dave. But I picked Aberfeldy as my all-over winner. And, yeah, I'm going to stick with them to the end. Well, there you go. You got it there from the tips leader in the footballer, Claire Valley. Claire, thanks for joining us on the pod and uh, look forward to speaking to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. And so we move on to Essendon for Division 1. Hello, if you've clicked through to this part of the podcast. Four reasonably one-sided results at the weekend, but all of them worthy talking points. We actually speculated on last week's pod, has the, the shine of a good start at East Keelor started to wear off? At the weekend, they actually led Tullamarine at quarter time, but six goals to no score in the second quarter turned this one on its head. And in fact, it was uh, 12 goals to just three for the rest of the day. Tullamarine winning 14-7. 91 to East Keel or 6642. Just the one multiple goal kicker, and it was actually Daniel Neville, who uh, is one of their gun midfielders, but he wasn't named in the best, which is interesting. And uh, Tullamarine, an even spread of goal kickers, uh, four multiples at the weekend. And Dean Bartrop, one of the off season recruits from Avondale Heights, was best on ground. So. Adam Saracoglu, Tulla continue to roll towards September, and East Keelor, uh, again, we, we keep eyeing them off as the potential upset special each week, but maybe uh, some of that goodwill is just starting to wear off after they picked up a couple of wins at the start of the season. For me, this game, uh, the tale of this one's in the start. Yet again, Tala Marina's slow start. That's uh, becoming habitual now for the Demons. Could, could it have been wind, though? Could, it, could we well, forgive I'm, them and say well, I know, two yeah. goals to three into the wind might be forgivable? Goal, goalless in the second term, Taylor. But then you look at that third term, the number four goals there. So maybe the wind was there early and dissipated. But um, yeah, for me, that's the tale of the tape in this one because East Keelor just might be uh, running out of legs perhaps now. Um, yeah, really good start to the year, a lot of energy, but at the end of the day, they're still only on two wins. And uh, fast becoming, um, along with the hillside, uh, the uh, relegation favourite. Well, and speaking of teams that are stuck on two wins, Taylor's Lakes, Dave Kennedy, still stuck there. Is it a bit rough to, to assess them in a week that they come off playing Craigie Burn? I mean, most teams are going to get you know, beaten by Craigie Burn this year, and in, in this instance, it was a fairly comfortable margin. 20-23 to 8-8 eight, eight suggests it probably could have been a bit worse. Cam Cloaks kicked eight, uh, which is, you know, reflective of the fact that once one of the Cloaks or Fletcher gets off the chain, they can be very hard to stop. But, I mean, how worried should Taylor's Lakes be, um, given that their percentage is still better than the other teams in the relegation battle, but they've had a, a fair bit shaved off here as a result of losing by 87 points? So they've lost by 12 goals, 11 of which have been kicked by Cloak, Cloak Fletcher. I, look, I think it's a hard week to judge them, as you say. Um, but um, they'd be disappointed that they weren't closer because uh, the, at the start of the season, we sort of thought, to, OK, maybe maybe they're, they're going to... Uh, you know, have a register a few upset wins, and, and well, they were two and one, and they've lost five in a row. Yeah, and and maybe they're going to uh, to go onwards towards another final series, back to back final series. Or is it back to back, or probably probably more than that? No, nah, more than that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you look at the the relegation battle, and this is probably being a bit extensive to, to drag Glenroy in here, but they're two and six, ninety one percent. Taylor's Lakes two and six, seventy percent. East Keeler are two and six, fifty nine, and then Hillside one and seven, fifty seven. So there's a, there's a pretty clear gap there. Adam Russell. Uh, at the moment, I mean, are we talking a lot about 
other teams and, and really the, the acid should be on Hillside because you look at their performance at the weekend. West Meadows winning by 43 points in the end, but that was after a little bit of uh, repair to the scoreboard in the last quarter. Hillside kicked six goals to four in the final term. So, I mean, is it still Hillside standing alone as the favourite or can we still say that all the other two win teams there have, have got to look over their shoulder? Yeah, I think it's relegation coming closer and closer to the Hillside that they need the win and you know the way they're playing it hasn't been too bad but I, I can't see them picking off a, a team above them Adam uh, you look at the best at the weekend uh, McAuliffe Catania Stone Benici I mean most of their top Premier guys are, plays. Their, most of their top guys are out there Stocko kicked three goals so even even with the best team starting to slowly get back together they're not quite at the races yet. It's, it's worrying for a team that you and I were both pretty keen on in pre-season and uh, at the halfway point, they're sitting a game clear on the bottom with a percentage just over 50. Yeah, like I just said, so a lot of those names and even Stocko, premiership plays in recent memory. So maybe there's that disparity between um, you know, some of their better players and, and what's underneath that depth uh, might be the major issue. We know a lot of their gun players are playing in the TAC Cup, not available for Hillside each week, so... Um, they're relying on um, a pretty stretched out twos side as well right now, Hillside. And to be honest, when we were there for that Glenroy game, there's a couple of great players running around for the Sharks, but by no means is there um, a full complement of 22 that uh, can get the job done right now, that's for sure. And the last game in Essendon for Division 1 was Essendon due to stars 16 14 110 to Oak Park. 10 9 69. Three players with three goals, two players with two. Shiloh Smith best on again. Cade Carey came in and kicked a couple, which is good signs for Duders. But Oak Park started the day in third, finished it in fourth. Tullamarine getting them on percentage by full time. And Oak Park have now come up against Craigie Byrne and Duders and fallen well short. Uh, final quarter of this one was uh, six goals to four Duda Stars way. So if anything, it uh, became a bit more of a free-flowing affair. But uh, Duda's had just done enough to grind out to a, a comfortable lead by three-quarter time. At, at halftime, we suspected Oak Park were, were right in it, some sort of a sneaky chance. But after the long break, uh, Duda's have, have shown the difference between the two teams. Good to see Cade kick a couple of goals there. Um, most talked about player in all of EDFL football, remarkably. Um, to be honest, though, that's a result that uh, probably accurately reflects where both teams are at. Dave, uh, Oak Park relinquished third spot to Tuller Marine. Tuller, uh, given how close they've been to the top two relative to the other sides, probably can now lay claim to being the third best team in Premier, I would suspect. I mean, they beat Oak Park, so uh, for all the, the worry about Tuller and their list turnover, you've got to say at the halfway point of the year, they've answered the critics and uh, they're probably heading for September again. Are they the story of the year, Tab? I, I, I just sort of feel like we, uh, we or, or Adam, or, or Adam, um, but uh, I just sort of feel like we had them written off uh, prior to the commencement of the season, and now, as you say, they're the legitimate challenger to Duda Stars and Craigie Byrne, and Duda Stars have, you know, as you say, they've been grinding in, in a few of their performances, uh, you know, that... They were, as you said, they were, they were ahead at half time and then and then kicked away. But uh, we saw them relinquish that massive lead to Craigie Burn. It's uh, it's interesting. Maybe Tullamore might give them a shake and, and produce the story of the year. By the way, surely we're going to Oak Park and West Meadows in a couple of weeks. That's that's my vote anyway for the broadcast game. Coming there is up. a very active poll on the EDFL website as we speak. Uh, Maribyrnong Park has twenty nine percent for their game against Keilor. Oak Park versus West Meadows is at twenty eight percent, and Mooney Valley versus Keilor Park is forty two percent. And it's well, one of the most popular polls we've had in recent times. So uh, vote, vote, vote. What can I say? Uh, my votes are Oak Park and Westie. Yeah, I caught the uh, the Oak Park Westie game at West Meadows earlier in the year, and it was a great contest. I'd definitely get my vote as well. All right, so uh, that's the way the commentary team is leaning. I wonder if the uh, the public will agree. Uh, that is Essendon Ford oh, Division One. Hold up, Tao. Pardon? Division One. Do you want to mention Robbie Mullen? Yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, I se- think we do. Seven okay. goals for West Meadows at the weekend. Best on ground. Uh, what would you like to say about it then, Adam? Oh, I just thought it, it's uh, adequate that he gets raised in conversation. He's kicked another bag and... Is he, is he closing in on the best and fairest? Uh, it's a good question. He's kicked uh, 31 goals from eight games. The thing is, when we went out to West Meadows, Dave Connell said they've been using him as a small forward because they think he's the best small forward in the league, whereas in the midfield, they've got other midfielders that they want to rotate through there. They would play him in the midfield if they had 
forwards of similar talent, but they don't. As uh, you mentioned, Adam Russell, quality player. A Definitely. Qual- a quality player. He's got uh, very good hands. He's, clo- he's uh, good in close, good on the outside, a good midfielder, but uh, as Dave Connell said, a, a better forward. And the other thing is, of course, Shiloh Smith playing in a winning team week in, week out seems to have been named first best in, in the Duders team almost every week. So he's probably the, the marker that has been laid down to this point of the season. Let's move on to Strathmore Community Bank Premier Division. Hello to anyone who has clicked through to this part of the EDFL Web TV podcast. And let's jump into the games because we had the grand final rematch. Adam Russell, you were there to watch Aberfeldy 2017-137 beat Strathmore 10-9-69. When we saw the score come through at quarter time, 47-14, to we all got a little bit worried that it could be a blowout. Uh, but uh, I understand that the start of the second and the start of the third quarter, Strathmore made their move on both occasions, and it was actually Aberfeldy in the second half of each quarter that kicked away to re-establish a 29-point lead at halftime and then 33 at the final change. Yeah, Strathmore, they were definitely competitive for a, a lot of the game. That uh, Their last quarter did let them down a little bit. Now, uh, as far as... Uh, their lineup: uh, Michael Sakura playing as a forward. He was recruited in the off-season, we thought, as a ruckman, but he's kicked four goals for the game. Uh, they also had Alex Grimer kick three, but I mean, was it just a, a lack of supply down to those forwards? They they lost the midfield battle that left them starved, or uh, did they actually have a, a bit of a balance on the inside fifty count there as well? Yeah, Sakura was one of the the players that got them rolling at the start of those quarters. He kicked three goals in that second quarter. It was. Uh Looked like Strathmore might be uh, putting in a in a challenge, but as we all know, they they did fade away at the end. Um, I think when Strathmore when they did go forward, they went forward very well, but um, ultimately Abbas were just a a class above, and the they just controlled the game over Feldy. And when we spoke to you on radio at half time, uh, you mentioned that Aberfeldy had ten individual goal kickers for their ten goals to half time, and they ended up with fifteen in, uh, different goal kickers out of twenty for the day. I mean, was that a product of kicking a lot of goals from the midfield or a lot of forward line stoppages or was it just one of those situations where they didn't have one designated target to kick to and were able to keep Strathmore guessing all day? Yeah, it was quite ph- uh, phenomenal to see how many uh, goal kickers they did have. I think it it was more of a... The way they used the space was really smart. I think their players worked a little bit harder than their um, their opponents and they, they did find themselves in space in that forward 50 but at the same time they did... Aberfeldy, they really wasted some, some of their chances missing... Uh, Goals from the goal square and fiddly handballs and over possessing the ball inside fifty. So I think they'll they'd want to cut that sort of uh, cut that out going ahead against uh, Greenvale. Now, if you want to hear Adam Russell's chat with the Aberfeldy coach Adam Potter, you can go down to uh, the time code links and click through and have a listen to that. But what was the feeling around the club? This was a grand final rematch. Aberfeldy was the runner up last season. I know that uh, it's a long time ago now, and we've had nine weeks of the new season for a new pecking order to be established, but. Was the song sung with gusto? Was there any real feeling in this like it was the first meeting between the sides since the grand final, or, or did it really not have that sort of uh, occasion to the game? No, they, they, they certainly enjoyed the win, I think. Getting that sort of that, that win back against after losing the grand final, it's, it's probably pretty sweet. Well, let's uh, look at the winners, Aberfeldy. Adam Sarakoglu, still unbeaten to the halfway point of the year. We'll get to the tips in the back end of the podcast, but what do you make of this performance and... I've sort of been going into bat for Strathmore week in, week out. Um, you can only talk them up so much after, again, losing by this sort of a margin. But, I mean, what impressions does this result leave you with? Are you, pre- are you preempting my tips for the weekend? I'm not in any way. Okay. Um, did I off-air hear Adam Russell say that Strathmore can still win the flag or did I miss here? No, I, I said they can play finals. I think they're, they're the strong fourth favourite. Okay, I, I might have just misheard you there because... They're a long, long, long way off right now to Moors. And again, um, that's a good list of names. I noticed a couple of new guys coming through. They're missing a couple as well. And they've had a few retirements. But this is a side that should be competing much, much better than what they are at the moment. But, you know what? Apophaldi is just a juggernaut. And then you hear about Angus... Um, Graham. Angus Graham coming in as well. It's, it's incredible um, what they're capable of right now. Apophaldi under a really good coach who I rate as well in... That, in uh, uh, Adam Potter so not surprised Abba's won um, particularly surprised though just where Strathmore's at I mean they're, they're almost a mess but uh, they could still play finals and make a fool of us all yet now let's talk about uh, West Coburg versus Keylor Coburg City Oval the venue and Keylor 
kicking away late after scores were level at three-quarter time. Adam Sarakoglu, you caught about the last five or ten minutes of this one on your drive home. Uh, what did you make of Keelor? What were the Was it a win that they in, celebrated and enjoyed, or was it more a feeling of getting out of jail after uh, escaping late with a six goals to three final quarter? Yeah, I think it was the latter. I said that the scores were level at three-quarter time, but by the time I got there, it was probably junk time, so they kicked a lot of early goals in that last quarter. But goal of the year contender, hopefully it's on video, uh, Nick Davidson kicked an absolute pearler from the pocket, um, just dribbling through, and it was probably the sealer as well in that game. Um, but yeah, as far as Andrew Brown's concerned, another six goals, and he's a remarkable footballer, and I just wish he had more help. Hey, uh, Chief, the umpires like the big men in this competition, don't they? Mark Blake, Mark Blake uh, was the winner last year. Could Andrew Brown win it this year? He won it the year before, Blakey. Yeah. Um, yeah, three years in a row for a Ruckman, that would be remarkable. Well, yeah, look. Well, do we have to start calling Keel. him a key forward? Because he's been their spearhead the last couple of weeks now. So Yeah, well, Keeler didn't even make finals the year that he won the uh, Reynolds medal. So it could well happen again if Keeler does falter again. Um, it doesn't help that, you know, he's had forced to do it a lot on his own. I think I saw him kick one of his goals late in the game there. Um, too much is relied upon him. But uh, that might be just a mark of just how just how much of a, a great player he is for Keeler. So... Um, yeah, you're right, Dave. Uh, big, big chance to get Reynolds medal number two. Safe to say we don't know which West Coburg is going to show up. I mean, they've played some shockers where they've been held to very low, you know, sub-50 scores and, and been beaten heavily. Uh, they've also pushed some of the better teams. They had that uh, tough loss to Marby, another tough loss at the weekend to Keelor. Some good signs that they belong in Premier, but uh, are they actually getting any closer to beating one of the top seven? The, the question is, are these the same good signs that we saw from Northern Saints last year and can you maintain and improve next year? I think you can never judge a, a team that goes up in their first year. It's If they remain up, it's time to judge them in their second year. So I think it's very much a case of watch this space for West Coburg. Extenuating circumstances at the Northern Saints. Um, the talent pool at West Coburg <laughs> is very, very good. If they can keep it together, even if they do get relegated this year, if they can still keep it together, get back up into Premier. If they go down into Division 1, I've almost already got them winning the flag next year in Division 1, coming back up to Premier. They keep a lot of this side together. Five years from now, they might just be a force. And they've got a pretty good coach at the home as well. Let's talk about Pasco Vale versus Maribyrnong Park at Marby. So Marby versus Paco. It was uh, at half time 75 to 23. And, and that sort of gap maintained between the two teams for the rest of the day. Nine goals to three in the last quarter, though, after Marby had battled back to within 44 at the final change. Ben Warren had 7 out of 11 to half-time. He finished with 10. Vinny Randello's great season continues. He kicked three goals. We talk about medal contenders. It's hard to pick them out of this Paco team because so many guys have played well through the course of the year. Marby uh, would be frustrated that they have now played the top three and, and haven't really been close. Admittedly, they got closer to Paco than they did to Greenvale and Aberfeldy. But when you're in Marby's position and you're in that four-team race for fourth spot, what you need is you know, the, the upset win, the bonus win that no one else is going to get, and they frankly haven't been close to getting it against anyone in the top three. Yeah, um, and Paco, just, uh, we just mentioned Juggernaut about Aberfeldy. Well, Paco have been really good at this, by the way. Those middle market teams, mid-range or lower teams, they're really good at really dominating and basically picking on these teams, and obviously they get their challenges when they meet the top teams. But uh, by the way... Uh, Milky Warren, guys, he's now hit the half ton. I won't ask if he'll get the ton. I'll ask when. Before finals, during finals, grand final day. How many more games left? Nine? Ten? I reckon he gets it done before finals. As to how many weeks before finals, it's still up in the air a little bit. I I think it's entirely dependent on if he has a 15-plus a goal day against one of the other bottom three. Uh, so I, I really think he could do it with two or three weeks to go in the season. Dave? Warren, watch this space. Um, I, I'm not 100% uh, sure whether he'll get it before finals. As you say, it's it's really the luck of, of whether um, Pasco Vale will go out and annihilate uh, some of the bottom sides or whether they uh, take the foot off the pedal, I guess, which, which will bring us to the, the next uh, talking point. Taylor. Two years ago, Patrick Rose was before finals when he got his turn against Airport West, I think. 
Now, the last game we've been holding off, and even though I talked about it on last week's podcast, I talked about it on uh, Web TV and also in the record and as part of the radio preview show at the weekend, and I'd been talking up the fact that Greenvale would go chasing that lost percentage uh, from the tribunal during the week. Uh, unfortunately for the Northern Saints, I wasn't able to, to reverse jinx it, and Greenvale very much emphatically went and got that percentage back and then some, and, and who knows? I mean, to, to keep the foot on the pedal and kick 24 goals in each half is a frightening performance. It's not what anyone wants to say in Premier, but uh, I mean, the reality is that Greenvale just decided to play four consistent, solid quarters, and they had every motivation and reason to due to the fact that uh, you know, they'd lost 76 points off their percentage at the tribunal during the week. Uh, very even spread of goal kickers, very dominant performance in the end. I mean, what can you say? Northern Saints, of course, were coming off a, a really tough couple of weeks. Uh, the loss of their reserves captain, Mo Alush, uh, it you know, it's still raw. It was the first game that all those guys had played since it happened. And they're a, a club that's in a very, very tough on and off field position at the moment. But Greenvale had every incentive to go four points, and that's exactly what they did. By the looks of it, minus a Brewer, and we're still not sure what exactly the concern is for him. It's pretty much a full-strength side that ran out at Section Road on Saturday for Greenvale. and un- Unfortunate for the Northern Saints, but you know, interesting to note that Fort Caruso, the only man named in the best, and I should say best singular, because uh, he was the only man in there. Um, yeah, obviously a sign that uh, there's still a bit of... Uh, you know, as difficult as circumstances are, as at least there's still a bit of care from the coach, and he's not happy with what the boys dished up, and uh, a bit of a message sent out there that uh, you know it was go time on Saturday. We simply did not get it done. We had no contributors, not good enough. And uh, I think, to be honest, it's probably a good sign that uh, that sort of message was sent. If if that is indeed why we only saw Fort Crusoe's name in the best. Now we were speaking a moment ago about what incentive Paco has to to go hard in the second half of the year. Greenvale's percentage has improved to 240. Pasco Vales is 174, so I guess Greenvale, in that respect, now have... It's not worth a win, but it's a lot, and it means that Pasco Vale are going to have to go out and produce similar dominant performances when they get their second crack at the bottom three. Yeah, it does, or, or it means that Pasco Vale need to beat Greenvale when, when they play next. So um, I think that... Um, I think that... Pasco Vale will just focus on, on winning and maintaining that one-game gap and whether they can do that uh, well only time will tell and um, if they can't they're probably going to go well Greenbow will we'll probably get them on percentage at the end of the season we were speaking in the Essen and Ford Division 1 chat about whether a small forward can win the, the league medal I guess Adam Marrick is playing as a midfielder and a small forward he's sort of everything everywhere all of the time and Adam Russell eight more goals you, it's going to be hard for the umpires to pick a three two and one out of that but uh, Greenville named him as their best and you suspect that he's going to be squarely in medal calculations come medal count night yeah definitely looking good from uh, Adam Marrick um, not too sure what his competition is who, who, does anyone have a, have a another suggestion I think Brown the Ruckman has to be up there uh, Aberfeldig someone like Mark Lynch, who's won the medal before, proven vote winner, has got to be considered. And he's also got his uh, look-alike Lance Oswald, which certainly helps the cause when you've got someone who bears your resemblance running around in the same team as you. Adam? Ben Ross won a list in, what, two or three years ago. He's got to be a big chance as well. Ab- absolutely. So it's going to be a, another stacked medal night count, but uh, Adam Marrick's got to be in the discussion. Let's leave it there for Strathmore Community Bank Premier Division and move on to our weekend tips. And, uh, of course, if you are listening to the EDFL Web TV podcast and you've clicked through to this section, you can also see uh, EDFL Web TV this week. Click through to the EDFL Web TV YouTube channel. And uh, we've got the preview video back this week along with the review video as well. We rolled them both into one over Queen's birthday weekend, but uh, now we're back to having two on-camera videos per week. And let's not waste any time. Let's go straight to the broadcast game. Section Road, we know it's going to be shown live on the scoreboard up there. Uh, the new Greenvale scoreboard is going to have the vision rolling at the same time as the action, so that's going to be quite a spectacle. And Adam Sarakoglu, it's going to be a game to match, we hope. I cannot wait uh, for that particular setup, Tao. And if anyone's listening down at Section Road, maybe a bit of web TV on there pre-game as well. Uh, we'll see how we go there. Yeah, look, this is going to be a massive game for mine. This is going to be the grand final preview as we speak. The replay of the 2013 decider. Um, I'm going, uh, I don't know if it is upset, guys. I'm, I'm going Greenvale. 
your Ab- Ab- I up. think you might even be lone wolf in the footy record this week, Tipping Greenville. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Bear in mind that you, <laughs> you, the default tipster is you get the higher team on the ladder, which is of course Aberfeldy. So don't read too much okay. into it. Yeah, nah, yeah. Aberfeldy, in terms of going for this particular premiership race, I don't think they want to get to the finals undefeated. So this might be a game where. Uh, have a look at what Greenvale brings to the table, perhaps. But uh, if they win, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. So Greenvale just wanted a bit more. Well, um, before I give my tip, Teo, I just want to pump up my tyres a little bit. Last time we did uh, the podcast, I gave my tips down at Marby. I did get 13 from 13. Where do I uh, hand in my resume for the, uh, the, the, the EDFL record tipsters? <laughs> Hang in there, hang in there for next year. See how you go. Maybe you can run for the board at the uh, at the AGM at the end of the year, Adam Russell. That'll guarantee you a spot in the tipsters next season. Or you can just replace me right now. I might improve my numbers. Um, Dave Kennedy, uh, before I ask for your tip, we we had a big podcast last week talking about a points cap and a salary cap and equalisation of local footy. I put it to you that it is round ten. We are halfway through the season. If both coaches decide to keep a few things in reserve, keep some cards close to the chest, as was famously suggested to us in Essendon Ford Division 1 last year, where we had almost exactly the same situation, probably two-thirds of the way through the season, as opposed to halfway through the season. But if we have teams going at one of my favourite footy sayings, half rat power, if we have a stalemate with teams keeping September in mind at the halfway point of the season, is that not a sign that the league is fundamentally uh, broken? And equalisation is necessary. Well, you have to you have to judge that based on on this week. Um, Greenvale obviously putting a lot of effort in. Um, you don't broadcast with three cameras on the screen just uh, just for the hell of it. You you're doing it because um, you want to put on a show for your members and supporters. And, and round one, I understand, was a bit of a modern classic um, between the two teams. And I can only hope that they do it again. But I guess that's round one when you want to lay down a marker for the year. I. I just worry that this game may not be the showcase that we hope... I mean, this I've, I've said in the record this week, this is the counter-argument to a points cap and a salary cap. This is local footy, as good as it gets, the best it can be, uh, with the clubs limited only by their own resources rather than by an arbitrary number. So, really, I think there's almost an onus on these two clubs to sell us on the fact that they should not be capped in the future. Car- the, keeping the cards close is absolute rubbish, uh, and I've, I've said it. I've said it ever since I heard it. I think it, it, it didn't work last year, as we know. And I think uh, if the chief's suggestion that Aberfeldy are going to um, are going to chief said that at, that Aberfeldy would may may go in half pace to this game because they don't want to drop a game, or they will want to drop a game going into the finals, or they may want to drop a game going into the final. Have I misquoted you there, chief? You're looking at me with uh, those uh, evil no, eyes. Can you finish mate. your point, Dave? <laughs> well, I, I think that if if that's the that the attitude that Aberfeldy are going to go in with, well, they're not going to win a grand final. You you have to attack every match with the same intensity and endeavour that um, that you want to um, that you want to the next week. Otherwise, you lose momentum. And we've seen in so many matches this season how critical momentum is not only within matches but to take it into the next week and, and moving forward. You you must capitalise on every opportunity during the season I disagree, simple as that the 22 that run out, they'll definitely give 100% That we know that for a fact and I'm not going to doubt that whatsoever in terms of the setups and whatnot. not, perhaps the mentality what, what they do right now during the week um, I'd be looking at this game as more of a more of an educational opportunity, I think, to uh, just assess where Greenvale's at. Aberfeldy knows they are the best team in the competition. They don't need to prove that. But uh, they need to take a really good look at uh, some of those other contenders, and that's the most important thing they'll get out of this weekend. But my point is big picture. I mean, I know you're looking at it through the, the view of they want to win this year's premiership, they want to end a premiership drought. I'm looking at it from the point of view that a points cap and a salary cap is coming, and this year's team uh, may not be allowed to be fielded next year at this year's salary. I mean, there, there is a handicap coming. And I think the obligation is on these two teams that want to be the best they can be and be only limited by their own finances and not limited by points cap at all. They have to prove to the rest of the footy world, they are to the 83% of people who want equalisation measures, they've got to sell us on, the, on days like 
this weekend that it is worth having them. Yeah, I, I see exactly what you mean. This has to live up to the blockbuster expectations that it has. Otherwise, the counter-argument to the point system, the counter-argument to the sal- salary cap doesn't work. And obviously, uh, from, from the, equali- the anti-equalisation argument is that it will... Um, but that a point system and a salary cap will mean that these blockbuster clashes don't occur. And as you say, there, there is an onus of responsibility on these two teams to create that blockbuster. And, and let's not forget, I mean, it, you get just as many blockbusters from a close competition where, say, you could finish anywhere from first to fifth with, with three weeks to go. And we know that that's not going to be the case this year. My argument is we don't want a situation where we have two teams in cruise control through the in half of a season because... There's nothing at stake in the home and away. You, we need something at stake in the home and away to create more compelling football week in, week out. And, and Chief, don't don't get me wrong. I'm a, I'm, I'm a, probably a passionate advocate of the point system and a salary cap. All, all I'm saying is that for the, the counter-argument to the point system and the salary cap, there has to be a big... And this is Teo's point as well. This is um, certainly something that I agree with. They have to put on a massive, massive display this weekend to to create a legitimate counter-argument to the point system and salary cap? I reckon the spectacle is more to do with the what and the how and less to do with the who. Simple as that. Well, uh, Dave, that's quite a build-up to getting your tip for this game. Who are you actually picking? I'm going to stick with Aberfeldy. I I think um, winning form is good form. They've got more of it than anyone else and I I, I just sort of think that uh, they might ruin the party out there at Greenvale. All right, other games this weekend. Northern Saints versus West Coburg. We'll go around the panel quickly. Adam Russell, winner and margin. West Coburg, 80 points. Adam Sarakoglu. Oh, West Coburg with Northern Saints will bounce back. Uh, this could well be 20-odd. Yeah, West, West Coburg, four or five goals. Yeah, I think it'll be West Coburg by about 60. Keelor versus Airport West at Keelor. Uh, Adam Russell, winner and margin. Keelor, 50 points. Keelor, and they might just uh, want to make a statement this week, so I reckon 60 or 70. Keelor between uh, 2 and 12 goals. And I'm going to say Keelor by about 5 or 6 goals. I reckon Airport West can, can hang with them, maybe win a quarter. Uh, Pasco Val taking on Avondale Heights. This was the first result of the season that really got everyone's attention when Pasco Val blew them away in the first round of the season. Uh, Dave Kennedy, winner in March. I think... Uh Pasco Vale, and I'll, I'll throw to the Chief. How much is Avondale Heights going to win by this week, Chief? Minus 50. Okay, so Paco for Adam Saracoglu. Uh, Adam Russell? Paco for Adam Russell as well. And uh, I have tipped Paco, but uh, hard, to, hard to gauge a margin on, on this one. I think that they will win uh, comfortably, at least 30 points. And this is the big one. Strathmore versus Maribyrnong Park. The top four in Premier as it currently stands. Keelor 5-4, and four, 116%. Maribyrnong Park 5-4, and four, 78%. Strathmore 4-5, and five, 97%. Avondale Heights 3-5, and five, 92%. Quite simply, if Marby want to see finals, they have got to win the head-to-heads because their percentage is way behind everyone else. And yet, they are a very good chance of beating Strathmore this weekend. And I've tipped them. Dave Kennedy, who is going to win when uh, Maribyrnong Park takes on Strathmore at Lebanon Reserve? I, I like percentage as a judge of form. I think Keelor are sitting about, what, what do we say, 110%? 116. Tra- Strathmore, 97%. So although they're 4-5, they're still sort of uh, keeping, keeping around the mark with points for, points against. Uh, I think Strathmore will win and, uh, and bounce back. I think that's because they're, they're well coached personally. When Strathmore finish fourth at the end of the season... This will be the game that they say we turned our form around at this game. Adam Sarakoglu. I'm really battling in my tips at the moment, and I don't know who's responsible for this, but there's some sort of miscommunication. You, now. I would suspect, I've, is responsible for your tips. No, I've just had a look at when I submitted my tips, and I've written STR. Now, I'm pretty sure that means draft more or not Maribyrnong Park. So we'll see what happens in the record when it comes out later this week. We will, indeed. And uh, don't forget to grab Team App because you get the record for free and you can join 1,200 other members. All right, that's it for the EDFL Web TV podcast this week. Don't forget the broadcast game, 1 p.m. on Saturday up at Section Road. Uh, my name's Teo Pelizzeri. Dave Kennedy, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Teo. Adam Saracoglu. See you guys on uh, Saturday, yes? Yes? No, unfortunately, I won't be there. No, um, Very, very disappointed. It should be a great game. I wish everyone on the call team good luck. I wish uh, Greenvale Football Club, Aberfeldy Football Club both uh, 
good luck because it should be an absolute corker. And Adam Russell, no pressure. We're throwing you in for your first play-by-play. Uh, so do your homework and uh, looking forward to a good call this weekend. Yeah, not sure I can uh, match the soothing tones of Dave Kennedy, but I'll, I'll give it a crack. Well, uh, thanks for joining us all this week. And thanks to Claire Varley as well, who was in the pod for the Division 2 discussion as well. For those of you listening to this start to finish, we are now going to throw it over to the interviews from radio at the weekend. Make sure you subscribe to the EDFL YouTube channel to get videos as soon as they go online. Thanks for your company this week. Now, speaking of uh, Essendon Ford Division 1, Essendon due to stars taking on Oak Park today, and their coach, Dean Wallace, has been good enough to join us on EDFL Preview. Dean, great to have you on the line. Thanks for speaking to EDFL Preview. Hello, Jeff. How are you going? Very well. Uh, a big test for your team today. It's second versus third and second spots on the line. So how's preparation been for Oak Park? Yeah, well, we uh, had the buy obviously, last week, and we sort of recharged our batteries. We gave them a bit of time off, and uh, we had a, a very good week on the track and um, generally I think history sort of suggested if you try and play, you sort of play well so hopefully we can put it together and play four quarters today. Yeah, um, Wally thanks for joining us again mate, you're a regular now, semi-regular on uh, North West FM and we certainly appreciate that but uh, you know, the, the win loss obviously looks pretty good for your boys at the moment, that, that blunder that obvious blunder on Anzac Day against Craigie Burn but other than that, uh, you know, collecting W's pretty much week in, week out but the form itself, has it been a little bit patchy? I mean, I know the draw against uh, West Meadows, uh, you know, some differing reports coming out of that. Uh, you know, how, how are the boys just going in general at the moment form-wise, you know, disregarding the win-loss? Yeah, we're still learning as a group. We're, um, no excuses, by the way, but we're, you know, we've got 14 or 15 new players that have sort of come together, plus, you know, the, the dude is regular. So we're, we're still, the dynamics of the group are still sorting themselves out and players in positions and we're still experimenting with, with some, uh, some things and I generally believe and it's not a big head or ego but I think our best foot is to come and um, yeah um, we can only play uh, as well as we can and uh, today's another test and our challenge today is playing four quarters. We haven't probably put four quarters together all year and if we do I think we'll be a pretty exciting footy club. The week we came out to do this for Web TV, we spoke to Cade Carey and then he got injured in the warm-up the following weekend. Uh, is there any prospect he'll be back to play this season or, or is that injury a, a bit of a, a psychological as well as a physical blow to his prospects of playing this season? Uh, some good news for all Duda's fans out there. He's um, having a run today and uh, he's like a caged lion. He's uh, been one we've had to hold back. He wanted to play a number of games where we hadn't sort of had the... Um, uh, probably the conditioning into him. Um, he's, he's generally a fit fella, but just footy conditioning. So, you know, you'll, you'll see him out there today, and uh, yeah, I wish him all the best. Yeah, good news for Kate, uh, and good luck to him. But uh, perhaps on the downside, uh, Aaron Kite just doesn't seem to be able to get right at the moment. What, what's the latest on where he's at physically at the moment? Yeah, Kate got the pretty uh, hard knock against um, Hillside up there, and yeah, he's had. Uh, couple of weeks off so hopefully you'll be right uh, to play next week or maybe the week after so it's just precautionary reasons and we don't want to risk him he's a quality player and um, yeah I think if we end up with Cody and Cade in the one forward line it'll be pretty exciting. Wally Adrian Jamison here how are you mate? Good Jambo. Um, now you've got a you've got your um, luncheon coming up with a couple of big names you want to uh, give us an insight into who's going to be there? Yeah, well, Duda's are uh, holding a, a, a gala luncheon at Mooney Valley on the 26th of June, and we've got uh, Mike Sheen interviewing Steve Dank uh, for the first time, so it'll be very interesting to me. Um, obviously, Danks has got a, an amazing story, and I don't think everyone's been privileged to hear in that, so, yeah, if you're interested in coming along, uh, just contact the, the Duda Stars website. There's uh, um, contacts there to basically come along and have a look at the luncheon, and also... Uh, celebrating uh, an icon and a legend of Duda's, Merv, Merv and Atos Atkins. Um, we're having a bit of a tribute to him and there's other footy flavours and we've got a comedian and a, a hypnotist. So Jambo, you should come along. We might get you up on stage and hypnotise you. That'd be good. I'd rather hypnotise you to hear some of your stories. Uh, well, we just... <laughs> no chance. Sorry, I'll just uh, cut in there, boys. Um, we've been speaking a lot about points cap and that sort of thing, and one of the points I made during the week on, on the TV show was uh, clubs in Division 1 that aren't necessarily all that keen to go back up to Premier. Um, I know you went there as coach last year, but you've got a lot of players that were playing in Premier, now playing in Division 1. Um, the, the fact that you know you guys are winning a lot more games now and 
there must be a much more positive feeling around the place, even though you're in the lower division. Um, yeah, it's just the vibe around the club at the moment, uh, you know, being a contender, uh, perhaps being a bit more relevant as opposed to, you know, really battling the last couple of years up in up in the Premier Division. Uh, how, how is all that side of it going? Just the general vibe around the place. Yeah, I think, I mean, dude, it's a very proud footy club, and uh, I've been to this club for since I come to Melbourne in 87 and I've seen some highs and I've seen some lows and um, it's a great club and I you know, honestly don't believe we're a big great club um, we've got a great junior program you know, we've got a great supporter base we've got great member sponsors and so forth so yeah there's some energy around the joint but that means bugger all until um, we hold the cup up at the end of the year and, and that's going to be a massive challenge if we've got a, a team up the road Craig and are, are flying and they're probably the benchmark so we've got a bit of work to do to catch them and um, the team that improves in the second half of the year generally is the team that you know, goes all the way. So we've got a lot of work to do as a club, but yeah, so far um, yeah, there's a bit of energy around there, but it means nothing until you know until the end of the year. Well, Dean, we appreciate you giving us uh, your time so close to the start of the match. We'll uh, let you go. Thank you for joining us on EDFL Preview, and we'll keep a keen eye on the around-the-ground scores as they come through uh, Essendon Nuda Stars versus Oak Park today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, fellas. Cheers. We're about to be joined by our Sports Moves Best on Ground, Jaden Walker, who kicked three goals today, did a lot of uh, heavy lifting in the first half when the game was hot as well. And uh, Jaden, as you join us here on uh, EDFL Review, congratulations. Firstly, a very impressive win. Second time your team has beaten Coburg Districts this year, it it must feel as though you've got their measure after an arm's length margin like today. Yeah, it was good to have a good win today. Um, Desi spoke about the game, how important today was. Win. We're sitting second, game clear, lose, we drop back to fifth and we're back with the rest of the teams. So we really needed to work hard today from the first bounce. Um, thought the back line held up really well. Um, the boys in the middle worked their butts off, um, pushing both ways. Exactly what we talked about before the game. You talk about working hard. Your work rate out of the blocks was something that really stood up to us. I mean, do you make the decisions on when you push up to the wing, when you come deep to get the ball, or is that actually something you've been instructed to do to work up the ground to lead to provide the option when your team's kicking out of defensive 50? Um, it's just something I've really worked hard over the pre-season. The work rate, I um, struggled last year a bit with my running. It was always a little bit slower, so this year I just thought I'd work hard over the pre-season, make the most, playing at centre forward, just push up and back all day, so... Jaden, congratulations on the win. Congratulations on your performance. What, what, what do you, when people ask you what position you play, what, what do you say? Are you a utility? We saw you in, in the defensive half for most of the second half and uh, probably up front in the first half. What, what, what position are you? Uh, I usually play up forward. Yep. So I played all my juniors up forward, played most of my senior football up forward. So it's just just always being told to work hard each way. Best forwards do it, so why can't I? So pushing forward, or, or sorry, pushing into that defensive half is an extension of your role as, as a forward, you'd say? Um, yeah, pretty much. Try to get back and help the back line out as much as possible. Some It's hard being down there. I know as a forward, the thing I love most is when it comes in quick and fast. So I know as a defender, the thing they hate the most is it coming quick and fast. So if I can get back there and give them a chop out, that's all I can do for the team. We noticed today that you guys, particularly in the, the first half, uh, well, probably throughout the game, just had problems converting. Was was that something you guys spoke about at, at all? Uh, you kicked uh, 12-24, so it's not uh, not the greatest scoreline and it could have been such you know, a massive percentage booster, but is that something you've spoken about in the post-game? Um, it was something we talked about at quarter time, actually. We just felt like the ball going inside but it just got a bit crowded and we weren't able to get open opportunities to kick a goal. So at quarter time, forwards got together, had a good speak. Um, Marco contested well all day, just bringing the ball to the ground if he couldn't mark it. So it's just a matter of getting our forward uh, crummers like Matt um, Casser down there just to get to the floor of the ball and hopefully score from there. Just on, on that forward line balance, you seem to have a good mix of, of talls and smalls yourself. Shannon Dawson was pretty good in, in the air. And then to have someone like Matt Walker... Any, any relation, by the way, Matt Walker? Cousin. Cousin, yeah, to, to have someone like him at your yeah. feet. And, of course, uh, James Margariti as well pushes forward at, at times. Um, you, you know, you've got a really nicely balanced forward line. Got a very balanced forward line. Actually, like you said, it's good to have three tools. With Macca back today really helped. Just meant that Shannon was able to get to chain today. So each week, hopefully, will be someone different. But like you said today, Shannon was really good. Marking above his head, kicked three or four. Yeah. So... Yeah. I think two in the end, but he certainly assisted with exactly. a few. Exactly. Yeah. So that's all, that's all Desi asked from our forwards, was just contest, 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 bring the ball to ground, and then let guys like Matt, Margs, Kassa mop up from there. So You mentioned your junior footy. Um, what's brought you to Roxborough Park? Tell us about your progression through juniors and, and uh, what's got you here to, to Roxy. Um, I played my junior footy at Roxy to about under-14s. 
have been made a move to Greenvale. I've been there since. And just through the year with my cousin Matt here, just getting into my ear a little bit. So I thought, why not come across, have a crack here, so... What what division were you playing when you left Greenville? Were you under 18s? Were you in the reserves? What was the, uh, the story I was there? Kind of in the senior component. So I was playing played reserves the first three games this year, but I played half a dozen games last year in there once. So and and finding Division Two, I mean, do you, does it feel like a step back? I mean, do you have to motivate yourself and push yourself, or is it still competitive enough that there still are enough like, challenges that you've got to be on your game? No, nah, still enough challenges got to be on my game. I know, um, like you said. Some people may look at it as a step back, but I'm finding it actually really competitive. So I reckon the boys probably hit a little bit harder down here. So, And uh, I understand you're a pretty handy cricketer as well. Uh, I wouldn't say that. No? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Um, well, you'd surely mix it with the winter cricketers across the, the park there. Yeah, we're, watching, we're trying to figure out why they're playing cricket in the yeah, middle of winter. It's a bit strange, it's a bit isn't strange, it? bit strange, but nah, don't rate myself as a cricketer. So, um, Tell us a bit about where the team goes from here. You pushed Hadfield. You exchanged the lead with him at every break. Yep. You must feel like you're close, but what's it going to take to actually beat him next time around? Oh, Like you said, we pushed Hadfield. We um, took a lot from the game, even though we got beat. Unfortunately, we got run over in the last quarter, but we, we were three goals up kind of going into that last quarter and five years just run out of legs with a couple of injuries but like you said we like I said we took a lot from that game so hopefully going forward like got Jakarta uh, Muni Valley next week Jakarta week after that so hopefully from that Hadfield game that was kind of a learning point for us so hopefully for me just put, keep pushing forward well uh, you played really well today and we were very impressed by the performance we just got one more favour to ask you are the sports moves best on ground and believe me this hoodie will be too big for you but if I can get you to just hold it out for us and uh, display it uh, for the sponsors and uh, we will have one that fits you a bit better coming your way very soon but Jaden Walker congratulations on being our sports moves best on ground today and uh, all the best for the rest of the season look forward to uh, seeing you at the pointy end later in the year thank you very much guys uh, a very happy coach I'm sure as his team Lands a big win. Mooney Valley got up today, so you haven't got second place. You've got third, but it uh, must be no, nice to know that you've landed a pretty important blow against a team that uh, you've beaten once this year. This was a very different sort of game, but uh, how did you see it from your point of view? Oh, really, really tough game. The score in the end, I was just talking to Chris, oh, really surprised me that it ended up that score. I thought it was tough all day. Uh, I thought the first half, we probably let ourselves down a little bit with our scoring and stuff like that, and our work rate dropped a bit. Our rotations went missing that second half of the second quarter. We spoke about that at half time, and they just got really desperate, the boys in the end. Worked really hard for each other, pushed back, uh, did all the right things that we ask them every week. And this win, probably not just this win, but this win's huge for us because we're on that verge with Jakarta and a couple other sides, and we sort of need to win these games. Now, we have to ask, because we've, we've seen your team do something that we don't even see at Premier. At Premier clubs, they might go grab a beer and take the boots off and, and walk around and, and have a few pats on the back. You guys are doing deactivation warm downs out on the second oval. What's the story behind that? Is that your initiative or a fitness coach's initiative, or uh, what's the story there? Yeah, one of our trainers is with the call to cannons, and, and that's what they do. And we've had, um, well, average eight injuries, eight injuries a week. Probably haven't had a full side in yet, and that's mainly because, been because of hamstrings, things like that. So we're just working on things to get that right. So each week we can pick our best side, and hopefully we're getting near that now. Paul, uh, congratulations on the win. I, I thought one thing that was really good um, was the, the, the clearances around the ground. I thought that you guys uh, were pretty clean coming out of those clearances, but then there was maybe a few composure issues. Uh, yeah. What, what, do, you, what do, you, do you put it down to? Do you say that, uh, because I think structurally you guys were really sound, it was yeah. just literally just a few times where players maybe just didn't take that extra fraction of a second to, yeah. to straighten up? Oh, we talked about that. I thought sometimes they gave the handball when they could have kicked and they gave it to a bloke under pressure. Sometimes hack the footy just by not steadying up when they've got it. We've worked a lot on that. We are probably a lot worse the first few games of the year with our turnovers and stuff like that. And we've, we've done a lot of work on it. And probably the last three weeks it's improved a lot. Today, again, there's a couple of moments, but there's a lot of pressure on out there at times. Um, but we work on our structures a lot. We work on our midfield setups a lot. And around the ground is very important too to get that right. So we do a lot of that stuff. And I guess you see the proofs in the pudding they start to use it on the ground that works for us compared to the team we saw a couple of times last year there's some some missing names and I'd like to know how far away they are and if they are still in your best 22 uh, Hamza Domeski uh, also Carlos Arden KJ Nana Pragazim, uh and also Omar Grosso maybe I mean are, are there more guys that are missing are you even close to your best 22 at the moment uh, this week's closer than we have been we've probably still got it's hard to say because now you look at this side and say, can we make a change? You know, there's, mm. But there's probably four or five that would be senior players if, if they were right to go. They'd be up and about. Uh, Omar Grosso played the first couple in the ones. 
we put him back just to work on his defensive side of the game, and it's slowly coming together. I think he was in the best last week. I'm not sure today. Uh, KJ played the reserves today? That's his second game back second from game a broken back. ankle. So, okay. Yeah, we're looking forward to having him at some stage of the year. Just build his fitness up now. Uh, we've got Hayden Brown, who should return over the next couple of weeks through the twos as well. He hasn't played a game yet this season. Uh, who was the other one you said? Uh, Hamza and Domeski. Uh Yeah, well, Domeski Dimmer missed today. He rolled his ankle two weeks ago and just didn't get up for today. He should be right to go next week. Um, uh, Carlos Arden, shoulder, but now we're just working through that, so we don't know how long that'll be. Mm. He looks like he's getting close. Yeah, all of them are close, but again, there's probably two weeks separating them actually to get it right. And we're probably... I don't know, six weeks to get their fitness up. So we're probably looking at the last four or five games and we're really trying to hit our full strength, hopefully. Once the timeline became obvious that Matt Mickelson wasn't going to play in 2015, did you envisage that by the halfway point of the year you'd still have the league leading goal kicker? <laughs> you'd still have Tim Blacker? <laughs> you'd still have uh, Jaden Walker doing his thing and moving up the goal kicking table as well? I mean, you, you really have uh, seamlessly replaced him and Shannon Dawson seems to be hitting the scoreboard a bit more as well. Yeah, yeah. Shannon, Shannon was um, played a lot of twos and played in the granny last year, and there were some really good signs. We talked to him pre-season about stepping it up, and he has. He's really stepped it up, and his work rate's massive. There's him, Jaden, Timmy Black, who are pretty really mobile down there, so they get to move around a lot. But Matty Walker's a freak. I mean, you know, he's he's pretty special. Why he's, why he's playing this great and hasn't been given a chance elsewhere, I'm surprised, because to me he's the best young kid in the comp. He's still not 18, I don't think, so... You know, he's just something special, and we're lucky to have him. But it's just hard work, boys, working the structures, working the setups, doing the right thing for each other. Like I was telling him, you don't have to kick 10, but if you can create eight, well, that gives us, you know, goals, avenues to goal. And they're they're pretty close bunch, and they work together. Jaden Walker's obviously come from Greenvale, which was a massive pickup for us, but it's not just what he does. He, he talks a lot to the other guys and sets them up a lot, and um, he's really good. He's You know, he comes from a high grade of football, and he's smart, and he's brought a lot to our team as well, and just talking to the guys and boosting their confidence. But... As long as we work hard, give an option, the tools give us something to kick to, and our smalls we rate as pretty good quality. You've got Brad Dimmich, who's just a hard, hard 16-year-old kid who's tough as nails. Blokes like that around the fall of the ball, we're you know, confident we can score big. And, and, and um, it's interesting, Paul, that you talk about um, Mickelson coming out. Do you think that that's sort of spread, uh, well, that it's spread the defence that you play against? Uh, because you now have genuine options in McKinnon, in Jaden Walker, in Dawson, and then Matt Walker as a uh, as a sort of small lead up crumbing forward. Margariti kicked a goal today. You've got a really good spread of goal kickers. Do you think that um, this has forced uh, you guys to rethink the way you go inside fifty as opposed to last year? Oh, it has, and I think even early in the year we still sort of bombed away and things like that. They're pretty quality some of the blokes down there, so you got to you got to kick it to their advantage and use their advantage. Um, no one in the side really plays one spot. Most guys are told, I mean, Reese Tarkson's playing centre-half back, but we've pinched hit him in the ruck. He can go full forward. Uh, Ricky's the same. He can go into the middle of the ground. Hoppo's gone up forward twice, and I think he's kicked four goals. So most blokes can play a couple of positions. So if you're down in one, there's no reason you can't go to the back line and man up. If if you're not able to run as hard as you like, go a bit deeper and maybe take grab deep. But everyone's pretty versatile, and we work on a lot of different options. Today you saw probably a pretty structured up one, but that rotates a lot. Like Jade Walker went into the middle today at times, and then we went smaller up forward. It's more to catch the opposition off, but more to give our tools a chance. If, if they can't grab it, there's, stuff, there's players on the mm. ground to take it. We sort of work. It's, it's sort of a combination. It's not really one star player. Like I said to Jaden, coming from that level, we don't want him to drop back to us. We want him to take us to where he's been, and, and, that, and that's the aim of it, to get higher, to work harder, to play better, and improve every week. And we're doing that. Like, when we go back, and I was just talking, then the Jakarta game was terribly disappointing to come out and play like that. first half was really disappointing for us. Um, it eats away at the blokes still, you know, that, that's not us, that's not what we're about. I think we've lo- now lost three games and they've all been under three goals. So, you know, we should really, like I said, the boys, if we come every week to play like we should, we should be nearly top of the ladder working hard, but we've lost games where we haven't come to play and they learn from that, hopefully. Well, Paul, we appreciate your time after no the game. Uh, all the best for the rest of the season. I have no doubt we'll be doing a Roxy Hatfield game, whether it's in the finals or whether it's in the home and away at some stage later in the campaign. But all the best with your team, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Paul Derrick, the Roxburgh Park coach, joining us in the box. And uh, waiting patiently outside the box uh, is Chris Tankard, the Coburg Districts coach, who's going to join us now. Tough afternoon for Coburg Districts. And, uh, Chris, we appreciate you giving us your time after the game. What did you say to the boys? You were out on the ground in a huddle for quite a while. Uh, was that the post-match address or was that player-driven? Did you speak to them out there or in the rooms? No, look, I speak to them out there quite a bit. Um, there's a few guys who try and get away from the cool-down 
after the uh, game. So I think it's important that we stick to a routine, whether we win or lose. And you know, and, and what we spoke about was just opportunity. Um, we didn't take it today. We had opportunity to put two games on Roxburgh Park, and unfortunately, we didn't take it. So, you know, and then we just speak about the plan for next week, getting ready for Keeler Park. Chris, um, where do you think you didn't take the opportunities today? Was it uh, in any particular um, element of the game or was it in any particular position that you didn't take the opportunities or was it across the board? Oh, look, I thought we defended really well. Like, we're minus 42 inside 50, which you deserve to lose a game, and we did. Um, but I thought our back six sort of controlled that and we pushed them wide, which we wanted to do. Um, just structure-wise, we allowed them to get off the back of the pack a lot, even though we, you know, we probably broke even at stoppage. They got the ball in a lot cleaner because our blokes didn't stick to what they wanted to do. And then they allowed them to have an out number at the back of the contest um, and then you know, just use the ground really wide and make us chase and defend. You guys won centre clearances pretty convincingly, but around the ground stoppages, one thing we noticed was there was just a lack of body on body and Roxburgh Park had too many uncontested takeaways uh, from yeah, stoppages. Definitely, definitely. Uh, as far as trying to change that once the tone of the game has been set, is there actually much the coaching staff can do or is it more a matter of you hope the players can recognise it and execute? Oh, look, that's a coaching thing, mate. We, we, we're off the ground, we get to see that. So as coaches, we have to identify and rectify that. So we will bring guys off to explain how we wanted to set up and how we wanted to address that situation. We allowed them to run through stoppage and get goal side of us pretty quickly, which allowed you know, many times for them to get a forward entry, and we just didn't allow for it. Hadfield did the same thing to us. We've trained for it for weeks, and unfortunately today was just one of those days where we just didn't execute that part of the game very well. Are you disappointed that your percentage took a hit? You've dropped about 20 percentage points today. Mooney Valley's had a pretty handy win against East Sunbury. Jakarta's beat Burnside by 200, so... I mean, I know percentage is one of the last things coaches like to think about, but in that sense, are you frustrated that the margin got out of hand there in the last quarter? I'm actually happy with the margin where it was. I thought we should have lost by over 100 today. Wow. Mm. Dave? Yeah, well, well, you mentioned the the defence and, and some of those guys that that's, that stood up. I thought Sheriani was, was reasonably good back there. had a, lo- a lot of work, and um, I think that there was a, a, a few contributors. Wallace uh, was... Uh, oh, sorry. Our Campbell was another one that that, that stood out for me. Um, where, where do you where, like? You're going to come up against Roxburgh Park later in the year. Structurally, do you, have you have you sort of got a few ideas that you want to that you want to change? Obviously, you might you might not be uh, willing to put them out on on the air now. But have you already started to think about or, or mapping how you're going to beat them the next time? Yeah, look, it all comes down to personnel. Like, you know, I'd love to be able to play Dan Campbell on a wing. You know, I think he's got the athleticism and the height to do so. We had to play him down on Dawson and. Um, McKinnon today um, again for me yeah look I, we're pretty open like I let Adrian come in before the game it's we don't, we're not rocket science we mm. just try and execute a few small things that we think are very important to us um, we didn't do though we, you know, we hit one of our KPIs today but against Roxford Park we just got to not let them get the football out the back of the, the stoppage and not dominate us at stoppage. And we had a chance to, especially after, a, I, I thought they controlled the first quarter pretty well and didn't put us away. Um, however, yeah, we didn't take our opportunity. So for us, it's about looking at the video and, and the best thing for us is being able to go back, review video and really show them what we're talking about. And hopefully we improve from there. And, and Chris, you talked about that first quarter. I think Roxburgh Park kicked eight behinds of which I think you kicked to the far side or to the bench side every time. So, in a sense, that must be comforting for you as a coach because you've obviously implemented some sort of structure there. It maybe didn't come off in execution, but obviously the players are willing to listen to the coaching staff and are, are, are trying to you know, uh, execute the, the directions from the coaching staff. Yeah, look, they've been, it's been really pleasing since I've been down here. So the two, yeah, this is my second year, and we've changed the style of gameplay a lot. Um, and again, you know, it's just habit I think they they go out there they know that that's my side of the ground I've got my eyesight's not is as good. that is that what it is, is no. it, do you think or? no I, look I don't know look Delmo normally plays that wing and he's pretty important to us with his run and carry um and f- seems to find a lot of space I mean when black lines up on a wing on you don't get a lot of space but um look I think they just like kicking the football out there mate. <laughs> that's a, yeah. it's actually amazing that we, we've had that exact same thing from from a number of coaches <laughs> who have said that but um yeah I, I guess um the other thing that I've noticed is that the level of professionalism from your side to stay out there on, on the ground, you're wearing pants and black shoes today. You've got you know a good, a nice, uh, strong kid on uh, as a coach. Is professionalism a really important aspect of it in your two years here or in your second season? Yeah, look, at this change. It was something that Alan Chandler, our president, wanted to see change. So this time last year we were 
you know, just struggling to get twos players. We had nine missed today in the twos, which is really strong. And the the pants and the shoes, believe me, I'd be in thongs and shorts if I could. <laughs> but the uh, this is player driven. Yeah. And I think it's very important that everyone you know gets here at quarter to eleven. They're all dressed in the the you know the club kit and they're representing a a very proud club. And you know we need to do so and set a standard. And you know what happens is if you don't turn up, you pay a fine, and it's I reckon it's pretty good. So. Um, yeah, and most of the guys adhere to that, so which is great. Well, uh, we appreciate the uh, hospitality from Coburg Districts today. Commiserations on the result, and we look forward to seeing your team again at a later stage of this season. Thanks very much, boys. Have thank, a good night. Thank you to Chris Tankard, the coach of Coburg Districts, joining us here in the box. Adam, thank you for joining us. Not a problem. Good win today. Uh, what were you most happy about? Yeah, look, was to be honest, it was a frustrating day. Uh, we made a lot of errors with how we, we moved the ball. Um, you know, most pleasing was probably uh, Jack McNamara and the ruck um, up against it. I thought he, he battled manfully all day. Um, you know, our stoppage work after quarter time was good and we were able to, you know, generate enough ball in the front half. And probably our finish that last quarter, we were down to one rotation and we uh, were able to finish off well. You mentioned you were down that one rotation. We saw the injury to Courtney Johns and as well as uh, Kyle Remus. Can you give us a little more insight to, to what, where they stand for next week? Yeah, Kyle was more precautionary, um, just a bit tight in the calf. And uh, Johnsy just copped a knock in terms of concussion with the rules these days. We just didn't want to take any risks. So he was off sort of 10 minutes into the first quarter. Um, you know, as our number one ruckman. And that there being a bit taller, it meant we had to throw Cravo... Um, Jacob Craven up the ground, which you know left us a little bit short down back. So, as I said, the boys, um, you know, continued to uh, be really good defensively and put pressure on. Uh, we were just a little bit concerned with some of our ball movement options today. Now, last time you came up against Strathmore, it was in that grand final. Did you use that as a motivation factor during the week? No, definitely not. Uh, we just plan each and every week for our upcoming opposition. They've had changes. We've had changes. Uh, definitely didn't use it um, as any external motivation whatsoever. Some of the players that played may have used it as an internal motivator, but definitely not discussed as a group. Now, looking ahead to our next week, you've got Greenvale. How do you prepare for them? Yeah, look, they're a quality side. Um, the round one battle was a, was a really good game. I thought we played one quarter of footy against them. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky, you know, get out of jail free in some ways. So um, we'll, we'll prepare really well. And, um, you know, now that I've had a good look at the round one and um, you know, I had a look at him a second time. I'm looking forward to finding out, you know, exactly where we're at. It's a big game for both clubs, so um, always a good battle, that's for sure. Now you've brought Angus Graham into the uh, into the club. What do you expect from him going forward? Oh, look, it's going to take him some time to, to settle in. Um, obviously, Big Blake, he's had some niggling injuries and he's unlikely to play again this year. So um, Angus, you know, who I've had a relationship with for since sort of the end of 2006 um, has come back to Melbourne for personal reasons and work opportunities so yeah we've got him for the next two and a half years which is really pleasing for our footy club and we'll just um, you know get him to training on Tuesday and sum it up whether he's right to go next week or we just wait till uh, the game after well once again congratulations on the win Adam good luck to next uh, next week and uh, I hope for a successful season going forward cheers mate thanks very much